Hare Krishna. Welcome to Books to Krishna. I'm sure you must have heard and seen the episode 2 of Lila Mirth. Today we are basically going to cover chapter 2 of Lila Mirth, the biography of Srila Prabhupada. This chapter is about his college education, his marriage and Gandhi's movement. This book in seven volumes has been written by Satya Surup Das Goswami and all rights to the books are with the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust. So welcome to episode 3 of Leela Mrit. I joined Gandhi's movement in 1920 and gave up my education. Although I had passed my final examination BA, I gave it up and did not appear. Srila Prabhupada. In 1914, the war came and many Indians enlisted in the fight on behalf of their ruler, Great Britain. Abhay saw British airplanes landing on the racetrack in Medan Park and the newspaper told him of the war, but he was not directly affected. In 1916, he began college. There were two prestigious colleges in Calcutta, Presidency and Scottish Churches. Abhay entered Scottish Churches College. It was a Christian school, but well reputed amongst the Bengalis and many Vaishnava families sent their sons there. The professors, most of whom were priests in the Church of Scotland, were known as sober, moral men, and the students received a good education. It was a proper and respectable institution, and since it was in North Calcutta and not far from Harrison Road, Gaur Mohan could keep Abhay at home. Gaur Mohan had long ago decided that he would not allow Abhay to go to London and in the name of education become exposed to the corruption of the West. <clears throat> he wanted Abhay to be a pure devotee of Shrimati Radharani and Lord Krishna. Yet, on the other hand, Gaur Mohan didn't want to give up his son to become the Brahmachari disciple of a guru. Where was such a qualified guru to be found? His experience of yogis and swamis had not inspired such confidence. He wanted his son to keep all the principles of spiritual life, yet he also knew that Abhay would have to marry and earn a livelihood. Under the circumstances, enrolling Abhay in Scottish Church's college was the most protection Gaur Mohan knew to give his son. The college had been founded by the revered Alexander Duff, a Christian missionary who had gone to Calcutta in 1830 a pioneer in getting Indians to appreciate European civilization, the river A. Duff had first founded a general assembly institution for propagation of the gospel through education, at once liberal and religious, on Western principles, and with English as the medium of instruction in the higher classes. Later, he had founded the College of the Church of Scotland, and in 1908, had amalgamated with both institutions as Scottish Churches College. Srila Prabhupada said, We respected our professors as our fathers. The relationship between the students and the professor was very good. The Vice Chancellor, Professor W.S. Urquhart, was a perfect and kind hearted gentleman with whom. We sometimes joked. In the first year, Prabhupada said, I studied English and Sanskrit. In my second year, Sanskrit and philosophy, then philosophy and economics. Another professor was J.C. Scrimigore. He was professor of English literature. While teaching English literature, he would give parallel passages from 
Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. Yes, yes, he would say, your Bankim Babu says like this. He has studied Bankim's literature and he compared Bankim Chandra Chatterjee to Walter Scott. In those days, Dickens and Sir Walter Scott were two great English literary men. So he taught us those novelists and the relationship was very nice. Abe became a member of the English society and would recite Keats, Shelley, and other poets to his classmates. As a member of the Sanskrit society, he recited the Gita and some of his fellow students especially noted how eloquently he recited the 11th chapter describing the universal form of Krishna. He also played soccer and took part in theoretics. Amritlal Bose, a famous organizer and director of theater in Bengal, rehearsed Abhay and a group of his classmates in a drama from the life of Lord Chaitanya. Since Chaitanya Leela was available in the public theater for half a rupee, Mr. Bose argued that what was the need for an amateur production? And his answer was, they should appreciate your performance of Lord Chaitanya so much that after seeing it, they will agree never to sin. The eminent director was volunteering his service and training these boys, but on one condition, they would not perform publicly unless he said the production was perfect. For more than a year, Abe and other rehearsed the Chaitanya play until finally their director allowed them to stage a public performance. Abe playing the part of Advaita Acharya noticed that many people in the audience were crying. At first, he could not understand why, but then he realized that because the players had been well trained and because they were sincere, the audience was moved. That was Abhay's first and last dramatic performance. Abhay's psychology teacher, Professor Urkhart, gave evidence that women's brain weighed less than man's. His economic professor lectured on Marshall's theory that family affection is the impetus for economic development. In Sanskrit, Abhay used a text by Roe and Webb that described as Sanskrit as the mother of all languages. While studying Kalidas Kumara Sambhav in Sanskrit, Abhe was impressed by Kalidas' explanation of word dhira, which means undisturbed or self-control. According to Kalidas, once long ago, Lord Shiva was sitting in deep meditation because the demigods were at war with the demons. They wanted a commander in chief born from the semen of Lord Shiva. So the demigods sent a beautiful young girl, Parvati, to interrupt his meditation. Although Parvati worshipped Lord Shiva and even touched his genitals, he was not disturbed. His resistance to temptation was a perfect example of being dhira. As at other British run schools in India, all the European teachers at Scottish churches had to learn a local language. Once Professor Urkahat walked past Abay and a group of students as they were eating some peanuts and taking and talking together, one of the students speaking in Bengali made a joke of Professor Urkahat's expense. To their surprise, Professor Urkahat immediately turned to the jokester and answered in Bengali and Abay and others felt ashamed. Bible study was compulsory. The Bible Society had issued each student a beautifully bound Bible and each morning everyone gathered for scripture reading, prayers and hymns. One of the professors criticized the Vedic teachings of karma and transmigration of soul. In a court of law, one cannot be prosecuted for a crime unless there is a witness. Similarly, he argued, although according to Hindus, the soul suffers in his present life 
for the misdeeds of his past life, where is the witness of these misdeeds? Abe was displeased to hear this criticism and he knew how to refute it. But being only a student, he had remained silent. Socially, he was inferior and a student had little scope to challenge a professor. But he knew that the professor's argument against karma was insubstantial. He knew there was a witness. Some of the students having come to Calcutta from small villages viewed the big city and the presence of so many Europeans with bewilderment and timidity. But to Abhay, Calcutta and the British were not alarming and he even held a certain fondness for his Scottish teachers, although he looked up to them with a mixture of awe, distance and some tension. He admired their moral uprightness and their gentlemanly courteous behavior with the boys. They seemed to him kind-hearted. The governor of Bengal, who was Scottish, once came to Scottish church colleges visiting all the classrooms. The rooms were large, holding 150 students, but Abe had a front row seat and got a close look at the famous governor, the Marcus of Zetland. The school operated on the principles of strict social distance between Europeans and Indians. Even the Bengali faculty members, being a supposedly inferior race, had to use a faculty lounge separate from that of the European professor. Part of the college syllabus was England's work in India by M. Ghosh, an Indian. The book elaborately explained how India had been primitive before the British rule. Abe's economic professor would sometimes shout at his class when he became frustrated with their slowness, addressing them as representatives of the whole Indian nation, he would say, you should never expect independence. You cannot rule. You can only work like asses. That's all. College life was demanding. No longer was Abe free to spend hours before the deities of Radha and Govinda early in the morning. That had been a boyhood luxury when he would daily pass hours in the Malik's temple before the golden form of Radha Govinda, watching the Pujaris as they worship the deities with incense, flowers, lambs, musical kirtan and opulent prasadam. As a child, he had played within the grassy compound of the temple or watched the men cooking kachoris on the roadside or bicycled or flown his kite with Bhavantarini. His life had always centered on his home at Harrison Road. His mother's talks, his father worshipping Krishna, these scenes were now past. Now he spent his days within the compound of Scottish Church's College. Here there were also a lawn and a garden with birds and even a small banyan tree. But instead of worship, there was study. The atmosphere at Scottish churches was academic and even the casual conversation among the students as they gathered before the notice board at the main entrance or passed in groups in and out of the main gates was usually about class assignments or collegiate activities. When Abhe was not actually sitting side by side with his fellow students sharing a classroom bench before one of the long desks that stood row after row in the lecture hall, when he was not looking attentively forward during the lecture of one of his professors, usually a revered dressed in a European speak, suit, speaking a Scottish brow and pronouncing words like duty as, as jutti, when he was not actually in the classroom hearing their lectures on Western logic or chemistry or psychology, then he was at his homework assignment sitting at a table amidst the bookshelves in the college library, reading from an open book 
or writing notes while the electric fans overhead rippled the pages or he was at home with his father, sister and brothers. But reading his lessons or writing a paper for the revered in the lecture hall. He had had to abandon worshipping the Krishna deity. He had demanded his father give him years before he had retired his deities to a closed box. Gaur Mohan was undisturbed that his pet son could no longer attend to all the devotional activities of his childhood. He saw that Abe was remaining pure in all his habits, that he was not adopting Western ideas or challenging his own culture, and that as a student at Scottish Church's College, he would not likely be exposed to immoral behavior. Gaur Mohan was satisfied to see Abhay getting a good education to prepare for a career after graduation. He would be responsible Vaishnava. He would soon marry and get a job. One of Abhay's classmates and close companion was Rupendranath Mitra. Abhay and Rupen would study together and sit side by side in the assembly hall during Bible class, uttering the compulsory prayers. Rupen noticed that although Abhay was a serious student, he was never enamored of Western education or ambitious for scholastic achievement. Abhay would confide to Rupen, I don't like these things, and sometime he spoke of moving away. What are you thinking? Rupen would ask and Abhay would reveal his mind. Rupen found that Abhay was always thinking about something religious, something philosophical or devotional about God. Abhay studied the Western philosophers and scientists, yet they held no fascination for him. After all, they were only speculating and their conclusions were not in the devotional mood and spirit of the Vaishnava training he had received from his father and the Vedic scriptures. The sudden access to the wealth of Western knowledge, which created in some an appetite to study deeply and in others a desire to get ahead in the world through good grades and career left Abhay untouched. Certainly within his heart, he was always thinking of something religious, something philosophical or devotional about God. And yet, as a Scottish Church's college man, he gave his time and attention to academic life. One night after his first year of college, Abhay had an unusual dream. The deity of Krishna, his father had given him, appeared to Abhay complaining, Why have you put me away in the box? You should take me out and worship me again. Abhay felt sorry that he had neglected his deity and he resumed his worship of Radha and Krishna at home despite his assignments. In the class, one year ahead of Abhay was a very spirited nationalist, Subhash Chandra Bose. He had been a student at Presidency College, but had been expelled for organizing student strike against a British professor who had repeatedly abused Indian students. At Scottish churches, Bose appeared to be a serious student. He was secretary of the philosophy club and was working cooperatively with the vice chancellor, Urquhart. From Subhas Bose and others, Abe heard talks of Indian independence. He heard the names well known in his native Bengal, Vibhan Chandra Pal, who had fought to repel the Arms Act. Surindranath Banerjee, who startled the British with the agitation against the 1905 partition of Bengal. Lala Lajpat Rai, and most notably, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Scottish Church's college was strict in forbidding anti-government propaganda, but the students were sympathetic 
the cause of the home rule. Although there were no open signs of rebellion, students sometimes held nationalistic meetings in secret. When Subhash Chandra Bose urged the students to support the Indian independence movement, Abhay listened. He liked Bose's faith in spirituality, his enthusiasm and determination. Abe wasn't interested in political activity, but the ideals of the independence movement appealed to him. Many Bengali speakers and writers expressed India's drive for independence, Swaraj, as a spiritual movement. For the nationalist, political emancipation was analogous to the soul's liberation from material bondage. Abe was interested in devotional service to Lord Krishna, the absolute truth, a conviction he had imbibed from his father and maintained since his childhood. Whereas Indian independence was a temporary relative truth, but some of the leaders of Swaraj, while admitting that the Vedic scriptures were indeed absolute, asserted that the original glory of Indian culture could not shine forth for the world's benefit until India became free from the stigma of foreign rule. The foreigners, they pointed out, blossomed and cast aside the, the preeminence of the Indian culture. Abe had felt this also. In his assigned reading in M. Ghosh England's work in India, he had encountered the theory that the Vedic scriptures were impure. Recent writings and that India's had been a spiritually backward culture before British rule and the spread of Christianity. There were many British insults against the Shastras, such as Abhay's professor trying to discount the law of karma. But if India could gain national freedom, then everyone, not only Indians, but the entire world could benefit from India's highly evolved Vedic culture. The call to Swaraj, although overt, attracted virtually all the students and Abe amongst them. He was especially interested in Gandhi. Gandhi always carried a Bhagavad Gita. He daily read Lord Krishna's holy words and spoke of being guided by the Gita above all other books. Gandhi's personal habit was pure. He abstained from all intoxication, meat-eating, and illicit sex. He lived simply like a sadhu, yet he seemed to have more integrity than the begging sadhus Abe had seen so many times. Abe read his speeches and followed his activities. Maybe Gandhi could carry spirituality into the field of action, the Gita's truth. Gandhi proclaimed belonged in a most prominent place where the Gita not only could be read but could work for everyone's freedom and the symbol of the freedom was Swaraj. Nationalist sympathies at Scottish Church College remained underground during Abe's years as a student. It was a prestigious school. A student had to study very seriously to obtain a degree and he could then look forward to a fine career. To speak openly against British rule and in favor of independence meant to risk being expelled, to lose education and career. Only the most rebellious would dare. So the students met undercover and listened to the revolutionary leaders. We want Swaraj. We want independent. Our own government. Our own schools. Gaur Mohan wanted his son and watched his son with concern. He saw Abhe not as one of the hundreds of millions of instruments meant to change India's political destiny, but as his pet son. His first concern was for Abhe's welfare. While world events moved across the stage of history, Gaur Mohan concentrated on his son's future as he hoped it would be and as he had always prayed, it would be, he was planning for Abe to become a pure Vaishnava, a devotee of Radharani. He had taught Abe to worship Krishna. 
and he by pure be a pure character and had arranged for his education now gor mohan thought of getting him married according to the vedic system a marriage should be carefully arranged by the parents and it should take place before the girl reaches puberty gor mohan had gotten his first daughter married in her ninth year his second daughter at 12 years and his third daughter at 11 years when his second daughter was going on 12 rajini had said i shall go to the river and commit suicide if you don't get her married at once in the vedic system there was no courtship nor was the couple allowed to live together during the first years of their marriage the young girl would begin serving her husband by cooking for him at her parents house and coming before him to serve him his meal or by taking part in some other formal action then as the boy and girl grew to physical maturity they would become so lovable to one another that they would be inseparable the girl would naturally remain faithful to her husband since she would have no association with any other boy as she grew to puberty Gaur Mohan had many friends in Calcutta with eligible young daughters and for a long time he had been considering a suitable wife for Abhay after careful consultation he finally chose Radha Rani Datta the daughter of a Swarna Vanik family associated with the Malik's Radha Rani was 11 years old after the meeting between her father and Gaur Mohan both families agreed upon the marriage Although Abhay was a third year college student with no income it was not uncommon for a student to marry and he would have no immediate financial responsibilities Abhay didn't appreciate his father's choice of a wife he had thought of marrying another girl but in deference to his father he put aside his reluctance for the time being he was living with his family and she with hers so his marital responsibilities of supporting a family would not be immediate first he had to finish college during his fourth year at scottish churches abhay began to feel reluctant about accepting his degree as a sympathizer to the nationalistic cause he preferred national schools and self government over the british institution but he could see that as yet no such alternative existed gandhi however was calling on indian students to forsake their studies the foreign run schools he said instilled a slave mentality they made one no more than a puppet in the hands of the british still a college degree was the basis of a life career abey weighed the choices carefully Gaur Mohan didn't want Abhay to do something he would later regret. He had always tried to plan the best for his son, but Abhay was 23 and would have to make this decision for himself. Gaur Mohan thought of the future. The horoscope said his son would be a great religious preacher at age 70, but Gaur Mohan did not expect to live to see it. still he had every reason to accept the horoscope as accurate and he wanted to prepare abhay he tried to plan things accordingly but there was no way to guess what krishna would do everything dependent on krishna and krishna was above nationalism above planning and the law of astrology and above the desire of a modest cloth merchant aspiring to make his son a pure devotee of shrimati radha rani and a preacher of shrimat bhagavatam although gor mohan had always allowed abe to do what he wanted he had also carefully guided him always on the path he knew was best now without interfering with abe's decision about college gor mohan set about to arrange good employment for him regardless of what else might happen 
Abey completed his fourth year of college and took the BA exam. Afterwards, with the ordeal of a final examination behind him, he took a short vacation. To fulfill a long cherished desire, he traveled alone a day's journey by train to Jagannath Puri. Srila Prabhupada said, Every day of my boyhood, I used to think how to go to Jagannath Puri and how to go to Vrindavan. At that time, the fare for Vrindavan, four or five rupees, and similarly for Jagannath Puri. So I was thinking, when shall I go? I took the first opportunity to go to Jagannath Puri. He walked along the same broad street where for thousands of years, Ratyatha procession had passed in the market shops and displayed small carved painted wooden murtis of Lord Jagannath. Although it was not Ratyatra season, tourists were purchasing souvenirs and in the temple they purchased Jagannath Prashadam. In the Jagannath temple, 56 gigantic offerings of cooked rice and vegetables were presented daily in worship before the deities of Jagannath, Balram and Subhadra. Abe entered the temple and saw the deities. On a side altar stood the murti of Lord Chaitanya in his six-armed form, manifesting himself simultaneously as Krishna, Rama and the sannyasi Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya was famous in Puri, where he had spent the last 18 years of his life conducting Hare Krishna Kirtan with his followers and dancing aesthetically at the yearly Rath Yatra as the carts were wheeled along the main road surrounded by thousands of devotees. Lord Chaitanya had danced and swooned in the ecstasy of his intense love in separation from Lord Krishna. Passing over the parade route, Abhe recalled his own childhood pastimes, singing and dancing in the street, the miniature cart, the procession, Jagannath smiling, his father and mother, Radha Govinda. Somehow the fame of Lord Jagannath had inspired him as a child and it had remained within him all these years. When shall I go to Jagannath Puri? His childhood dreaming of Puri and Vrindavan and his compulsively studying the train tables, scheming since the age of five to travel here were based on more than just a desire to tour Puri's marketplace. And he was not satisfied by once seeing the deity in the noisy, crowded temple. He had been impelled to come to Puri as a pilgrim and his motive was not his devotion, was motive was his devotion to Krishna. Now, nationalism was strongly influencing his life and he had recently married and was facing the decisions of graduation and career. Yet here, he was hardly more than a boy, walking alone in Puri, where Lord Chaitanya had lived and where Lord Krishna's Jagannath still resided. Abhi relished his break from the pressure of duties in Calcutta. He didn't know how the love he felt for Krishna and Krishna's pilgrim place would fit into his life. He knew that Krishna was more important than anything else. He was God, the supreme controller and everyone's inner guide. But there was so much token superficial service to God. Even the nationalist speaker, although they carried the Gita on their person, were more intent on nationalism than on Krishna. Only those who were sincere devotees knew the importance and attraction of Krishna, people like his father. An odd incident occurred at Puri. Gaur Mohan had given Abhay a letter of introduction to an acquaintance who lived in Jagannath Puri. Abe went to see him and was well received. When the man was offering him lunch, however, Abe noticed a small lump within one of the cooking pots. 
He questioned his host who replied, Oh, it's meat. Abhi was unable to restrain his shock. No, what is this? I had never taken meat. Abhi looked at his host in astonishment. I never expected this at Jagannathpuri. Ashamed, his host said, I did not know. I thought this was the best. Abhi pacified the man, but he put his food aside and took no more meal there. After that, Abhi ate only the Jagannath Prashadam from the temple. Abhi stayed in Puri for three or four days, wandering around the holy places and visiting the famous Puri seaside with a sparkling beach and strongly pounding surf. Several times he recognized some of the priests from the Jagannath temple as they smoked cigarettes and he heard of other unsavory activities of the sadhus connected with the temple. What kind of sadhus were these who ate fish with their Jagannath Prashadam and smoked? In this respect, he found Jagannath Puri disappointing. When Abhay returned home, he found his young wife crying. Then he heard how her friends had told her, your husband is not coming back. He told her not to worry. There was no truth in the story. He had only gone for a few days and was now back. Although his marriage had only recently begun, Abhay was dissatisfied. Radharani Dutt was an attractive young girl, but Abe had never really liked her. He was thinking maybe a different wife would be better, a second wife beside this one. In India, it was socially acceptable to marry a second wife, so Abe decided to take the matter into his own hands. He made arrangements to approach the parents of another girl. But when his father heard about it, he called away and said, My dear boy, you are eager to take a second wife, but I would advise you not to. It is Krishna's grace that your present wife is not to your liking. Take it as a great fortune. If you do not become too attached to your wife and family, that will help you in your future advancement in spiritual life. Abhay accepted his father's advice. He wanted to obey his father and he appreciated the saintly viewpoint. But he remained thoughtful, a bit awe by his father's forethought. And he wondered how one day in the future he would be advancing in spiritual life and be grateful that his father had done this. Your future advancement in spiritual life, Abhay liked the idea. He reconciled himself to the wife. He had been given. Abhay Charande's name was included on the posted list of students who had passed the BA exam and who were invited to appear for their diploma. But Abhay had decided he didn't want a diploma from Scottish Churches College. Although as a graduate, he would have a promising career. It would be a British tainted career. If Gandhi succeeded, India would soon be rid of the British. Abhay had made his decision. And when graduation day arrived, the college authorities learned of his rejecting his diploma. In this way, Abhay re registered his protests and signaled his response to Gandhi's call. Gandhi's protests had increased his pitch in recent months. During the war, Indians had remained loyal to the crown in hope of generating British sympathy towards the cause of independence. But in 1919, England had passed the Rowlett Act to repress the move for Indian freedom. Gandhi had then called on all Indians to observe a Hartal, a day in which people all over the country had stayed home from work and school in protest. Although it had been a non-violent protest, one week later, in Amritsar, in the public square known as Jallianwala Bagh, the British soldiers shot to death hundreds of unarmed, defenseless Indians who had gathered for a peaceful meeting. Gandhi then lost fate, all fate, 
in the intentions of the empire towards India. Calling for complete non-cooperation, he ordered a boycott of everything British, commodities, schools, ports, military honors, and Abhe, in refusing his degree, was moving to align himself more closely with Gandhi's independence movement. But his heart was not in it, just as he had never given his heart to college studies, to earning a degree to his wife, so he was reserved about becoming a full-fledged nationalist. Abe had become inclined towards the cause, but never really convinced. Now out of school, out of work, caring little for his career, education or wife, he remained at home. He tried his hand at writing poetry for the occasion of a friend's wedding. He read Shrimad Bhagavatam and the latest speeches of Gandhi. He had no immediate plans. Gormohan had his plans for Abe, and the college degree had been an integral part of those plans. But Krishna, it seemed, had other plans. The political protest of refusing the bachelor's of arts degree was more a mark of honor than a social stigma, and Gormohan did not reproach his son for it. But Abe still needed to take up some kind of work. Gormohan approached his friend, Karthik Bose, and ask him to employ Abhay. Dr. Karthik Chandra Bose, an intimate friend, had been the family doctor since Abhay's childhood. He was a distinguished surgeon, a medical scholar, and a chemical industrialist. He had his own establishment, Bose Laboratories in Calcutta, where he manufactured drugs, soaps, and other products for the pharmaceutical industry. Dr. Bose was well known throughout India as the first Indian to manufacture pharmaceutically preparations that had formerly been monopolized by European firms. He agreed to accept Abe as a department manager at his laboratory. Although Abe knew little of the pharmaceutical industry or of management, he felt confident that by reading a few related books, he could learn what he needed to know. But when this new young man was suddenly given the post of department manager, several workers became dissatisfied. Some of them were elderly and had been 40 years with the firm. They voiced their dissatisfaction among themselves and finally confronted Dr. Bose. Why had this young man been put in charge? Dr. Bose replied, oh, for that position, I needed someone. I could trust like my own son. He is signing checks for 40,000 rupees. I could only entrust the personal handling of my accounts in that department to him. His father and I are very close, and this young man is known to me practically as my son. Gaur Mohan felt he had done his best. His prayer was th that the principles of pure Vaishnavism. He had taught his son would stay with him and guide him throughout his life. Gandhi and the cause of Swaraj had disrupted Abhay's college career, and Abhay was still inclined towards nationalism, but not so much for a political motive as for spiritual vision. So Gaur Mohan was content. He knew the marriage arrangement was not pleasing to Abhay, but Abe had accepted his explanation that detachment from wife and family affairs would be good for spiritual advancement. And Abe was showing an inherent disinterest in materialistic affairs. This also did not displease Gormohan, to whom business had always been subservient to his worship of Lord Krishna. He had expected this. Now Abe had a promising job and would be making the best of his marriage. Gormohan had done what he could and he depended on Krishna for the ultimate result. Gandhi bolstered by his emergence as a leader among the Congress party, now openly attacked the empire's exploitative cloth trade with India. England was purchasing raw cotton from India at the lowest price, manufacturing into cloth in the Lancashire mills in England 
and then selling the monopolized cloth at high price to the Indian millions. Gandhi's propaganda was that India should return to making her own cloth using simple spinning wheels and handlooms, thus completely boycotting the British made cloth and attacking an economic base of Britain's power over India. Traveling by train throughout the country, Gandhi repeatedly appealed to his countrymen to reject all foreign cloth and wear only the simple coarse khadi produced from India's own cottage industry. Before the British rule, India had spun and woven her own cloth. Gandhi argued that by breaking the cottage industry, the British were sinking the Indian masses into semi-starvation and lifelessness. To set the example, Gandhi himself worked daily at a primitive spinning wheel and wore only a simple coarse lion's cloth and shawl. He would hold meetings and ask people to come forth and reject their imported cloth. On the spot, people would throw down heaps of cloth and he would set it ablaze. Gandhi's wife complained that the khadi was too thick and not convenient to wear while cooking. She asked if while cooking she could wear the light British made cotton. Yes, you are free to cook with your own milk cloth on, Gandhi told her, but I must exercise a similar freedom by not taking the meal so prepared. The cause of cottage industry appealed to Abe. He too was enamored with the modern industrial advances the British had introduced in India. Not only was simple living good for the long-term national economy of hundreds of millions of Indians, as Gandhi has emphasized, but to Abhay, it was also the way of life. Most conducive to spiritual culture, Abhay put aside his mill manufacture cloth and took to wearing khadi. Now his dress revealed him to whomever he met, British and Indian alike. He was a nationalist, a sympathizer of the revolution. To wear khadi in India in early 1920s was not a merry clothing fad. It was a political statement. It meant he was a Gandhian. Hare Krishna. Thus we conclude the audiovisual of the chapter two of uh, Leela Mrit, volume one which was College, Marriage and Gandhi's Movement. Please wait for the next episode, which is chapter number three, episode four, a very nice saintly person. Hare Krishna.